Okay, we are on Facebook Live. So, sir, do your do your spill as I try and do the backroom deals. Okay, welcome everyone. One of the things I do is I'm a learning experience designer. What that just means in simple English is I make learning not just a transfer of information, I make it an experience. And so I'm responsible for designing that end to end and whether that is online or um, in person. So one of the interesting games we often like to do when we are in person is a game called spin and run. What basically we do is you place a stick on the ground and have individuals compete against each other in teams one, two, three. But the requirement is this, that you spin round like 10 times um, with your head down, holding the stick and spin round like 10 times. And then after that, you, you need to, to run. For, for those who understand anything about human nature, you almost know how comical call and at times even dangerous that can be because when guys are GD, even maintaining a straight line is difficult. I must own up myself that the first time I ever attempted the game is after spinning, <laughs> I stood and instead of moving forward, I, I just fell backward. Um, I've never drunk in life. And I think that day was a confirmation that I should never try the bottle. I remember vividly a friend of mine holding me from the back, telling me, Sire, it's, it's, we're meant to go that direction. And I told them, like, I know intellectually, I know I should be headed in that direction, but my physiology is up and all over the place. So remember that story. Let me go to your story number two, similar principle. In high school, um, I went to high school at a time when um, caning, whipping, beating, choose your preferred nomenclature was permitted. And it would appear to me that some teachers spent any bit of extra time inventing new ways to inflict pain maximally. And one particular teacher was notorious for this. And what he would do is he would hold you on the head and spin you around, you know, in multiple direction. And when you are disoriented, the next thing you would suddenly feel is a thunder of canes on you. One particular time when this usually happened is during blackouts now in boys' schools, when blackouts occur, it's a period of intense mischief, ranging from noise to just downright hooliganism. So in a bid to keep things down, either prefects or this particular teacher would go, would come around. Now, unfortunately, one of our classmates had the misfortune of being spinned around in darkness. And upon landing on the ground, when the Kings began landing on him. The digital, the sound signature that came through indicated that mm -mm, where this cane is landing is not where it's intended. And true, he had landed on his back and the canes were landing on his tummy because again, he'd been spun, lost his orientation, and now he was on the receiving end of everything. Story number three. In Africa, whenever warriors um, used to go out to war, and still happens now in communities where war is a legitimate form or they think is a legitimate form of their everyday life, whenever warriors came back from either a reading tour or whichever activity of war, they were not allowed into the society immediately they were taken into what we would call decompressing camps and the medicine man. You, you, will, you will understand Africa did not have an employment. People had spe specializations and one of them was medicine men would come and they would perform cleansing acts. And one of those cleansing acts was drawing some blood, mostly from the head or from the foot of the warriors. And the idea was, according to them was, um, they had gotten a lot of tension and a lot of what they called bad blood as a result of being in war. And so for them to become rooted and planted back into society, they needed to be decompressed because before they could be, they could be decompressed and cleansed before they could be reintegrated into society. What's common in the three stories? 
Um, some of them are disastrous, some of them are humorous, some of them are comical, all of them hopefully have life. Is that life has a way of spinning us round and round and round. And when we've been done with spinning, often the expectation is that we will be able to just dust ourselves and march forward. But maybe at times it will be just like me where intellectually I agree, I need to be moving forward, but I just don't have the equipment. The whole spinning experience has made me lose both bearing and footing and my capacity to move forward is lost and I'm falling back. Or at times that sadly, like the schoolmates, life has spinned you round and round and round and your defense abilities are present, but you've landed on your back end, whichever other calamities or things are just busy landing on you. Or maybe we need to pick some wisdom from the old African way of understanding that when individuals have gone through a season of very disorienting or very traumatizing activities, rather than quickly reintegrate them into normal life, we we'll probably need to decompress them and cleanse them to help them um, get back their footing, their bearing, and their routine. So today, our entire discussion is about endings and beginnings, and especially when we've gone through the sort of endings which leave us uprooted and disoriented. How do we genuinely move forward? How do we align what we know intellectually with what we're experiencing physically in a way that we can be able, in my words, to move forward without losing vision, voice, or values? Back to you, studio. Okay, the studio is running Helter Skelter here, but um, who's Fraba? And I'm, I'm back. Um, okay, so in the African setting, we have to let the so um, the guests speak and uh, clearly um, our guests who's different from us, but the same is Jane, um, because her morning is different and she, she will tell us again, remind us what her death doula is and um, tell us a bit of her story because she got, uh, she dove, I don't like the dog, oh my God. No, I'm watching your dog go upstairs. <laughs> um, she'll tell us her story of how a bit of her journey through transitions. Um, so Jane, whichever part of English you understood over there from me, just go ahead. <laughs> okay, thanks. I feel so honored to be part of this group. Um, I, I used to be a teacher and a coach and had this life that I thought that would be my life forever. And then my husband got kidney cancer and died after four months. So it was pretty quick. And I had had no experience with death or change, unwanted change. Um, and after he died, I so connect with that story of being spun and having this, I think my, my journey of grief and transition was it's part, it's part your body and it's part your mind. And what I had to learn was that my body had been spun. So I needed to let it be the teacher because your mind cannot power through it. Like I, I knew what maybe expectations for me were around grief, but um, I had to listen to my body that was tired, that was disoriented. Um, and that's what I say. So I'm a death doula now. And that is someone like a birth doula it's non-medical and I just support people through the dying process and then bereavement. Um, and one of the people I say to newly bereaved people is give yourself permission to listen to your body because in many ways it's like they've been cut in half. And if you think of actually being cut in half, you would not expect that person to go to the grocery store or to go to work or to go to a party or to be able to really do anything. They are wounded. Um, so I encourage them to see themselves that way, to just rest and be quiet and and see what their where their body leads them. Um, for me, it really, I followed my intuition and in a way I never had in the rest of my life. I think when you get spun, everything changes and it is an opportunity to, to listen to what is your purpose. At least it was for me. And um, I followed my intuition and it was just interested in grief and death and mourning 
and I learned as much as I could. And then I found out about being a death doula. So now I'm a death doula in a nursing home with 180 people. Um, and I work with the folks who are on hospice and their families. Thank you very much. Um, Mukimba, as, as a psychologist, um, how do you help the people who are, uh, how do you help people uh, during transitions? How do you help them through this spinning? And um, if you could comment on the, you know, the Kubler-Ross, the, you know, the stages of grief that we've been told, the Dabda, is it legit or should we throw it out? And, and comment on anything Saya and um, Jean has, uh, has said. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to actually have a lot more of this conversation. I've been writing notes, so that's what I'm looking down. Um, the first thing, I kind of came up with my own description of what grief was, because like, 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 like Jane said, right? There's the physical part, there's the psychological part, and then there's the behavioral part in response to losing something. And death is one of the things that we commonly talk about when we're talking about grief, but there's so many other things that people grieve for, yeah? Uh, the transitions, there's transition from being a child to being a teenager to being an adult and the expectations that come with that. I also notice these transitions from being, you know, a single woman to being a wife or being a single man to being a husband or one morning just waking up and being responsible for a child. All these transitions and the process of grieving them is kind of similar, but it's not, grief can never look alike. So when you're saying that whole, the stages of grief and loss, I honestly think it should be thrown out because the way it's been made to sound is that it's like, you know, one step after the other, right? And the way with grief, it's so complicated and it's so unique with every single individual, right? There are people who can be hopeful one minute and then the next minute they are back to having shock and anger and frustration because it's not, it's not so prettily packaged, right? But the key thing is paying attention to the sensations that your body is telling you and what your mind is trying to communicate to you at that point and not rushing through the process of grief. So that's the one thing I do tell most of my clients, don't rush through grief. When you rush through the whole process, you miss out on so many things and being able to repurpose your loss gets lost in all of that because people just wanna get to the hopeful part. And you know, in our employment, like people who are employed, they get you know, given a few days off of work and then you know, you're back to work after whatever type of transition it is that you're going through. Whether it could even be a divorce and maybe all you get is two days to go through the grieving process or it's a loss so you get like a week off of work. And most people want to rush to the hope part, but grief and loss and transitions, they're very complicated and it's not as easy as packaging it into something pretty and you know, wrapping a bow on it and saying, okay, I have repurposed this and then now I'm okay, I'm hopeful. So I think finding purpose in your grief, talking about whatever it is that you've lost and acknowledging that maybe your grief doesn't look like somebody else's, like we could have lost the same thing or the same person and our grief looks very different. That is also very important. So repurposing, storytelling, understanding the uniqueness of your experience, because it's not, it's not curated. It's not from one thing to the other, to the other, to the other. One minute you could jump to, you know, anger and frustration. And the next thing you'll be depressed. And it's not all pretty and wrapped up in one tiny cute package. Thank you. Um, so uh, putting back your transition coach part. Um, so we need to also address the liminality, you know, the spaces in between. Um, do you want, okay, first of all, to describe what um, liminality is and how um, people go through liminality? I was number last in English, I tell you people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I was just wondering like, yeah, in a normal conversation, you three word like liminality. 
and we're going to just walk away from it. So um, liminality comes from the word limen. Limen is, um, the other word is threshold. It's the, when you're at, at the door, when you're at the doorway or a passage, that car space at the door between which marks the end of one room, the beginning of another room, that's really what is called the limen. So um, the concept or the idea of liminality was really popularized by a guy called Tana. And it indicates that it's one of the phases of transition. So um, transitions have basically three phases. One is endings. Endings meaning whatever it is has ended. Um, that was prior has ended. So you, you're no longer a child. That stage has ended or um, you are married and now your spouse has died, that's, that's an ending and it launches into a transition. You've begun or you've lost a new job. So that's an ending. So the first step is an ending, okay? And then on this other side, the third step would be a new beginning. Um, so that would be probably, um, to use the same examples, you've probably remarried or you've got a new job or you're non adults okay? So, one is one phase was ending, the other phase is new beginnings. In between here, these are uncomfortable. There's a, there's a space which normally is uncomfortable where the, the, the old is gone, the, the old is gone, but the new has not yet arrived or begun officially. So adolescence, a lot of adolescence is spent in this space because in mostly in adolescence, you are too old to be a child but you're too young to be an adult. So you're, you're sort of in this in-between space, which we call the liminal space, or you've been laid off at work. So the um, ending has happened and the new job is yet to come. You're probably interviewing or you're sending out applications and everything. That's called the liminal, that's a, the, 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 the in-between space, okay? Um, so, uh, in a certain sense, um, pregnancy, the nine months, in a certain sense, is a liminal space because you've ended your pre-pregnant period and you're really not yet a mother. You, you've not held the life baby, but you're in this in-between space where there are certain changes happening and there's anticipation of certain things happening. So it's trying to use the same example, lim liminal space. Now, I'll, I'll give what happened traditionally, and then I will say what happens currently, how people deal with liminal spaces. So liminal spaces can happen um, by design, or they can happen just by default. A good example of a designed liminal space is circumcision. So in many African cultures, um, circumcision ceremonies involve taking the initiate, okay? Um, out of their society. So if you're like a bukusu, you're covered in mud, you dipped in the river uh, for the circumcision ceremony. But before that, and for a period after that, you, you live away from the community. You live um, among the Kisi and the Maasai, you live away in the bush, you know, where you go through some specialized training, specialized um, food, and you're having, so you are detached from the community to show your period as a child is over. And then you're spending this time with your age mates. And then when it is done on that liminal space or that in-between space is done, there's a whole period and process of reintegrating you back into the community. Such designed liminal or in-between experiences had people we called masters of ceremony, which would be the guy who or, um, was leading in the, in the circumcision ceremony. And then there'd be these older people who'd be training you on what it is to be a man, how to hunt and do all of those things. So in psychological practice, we call these people masters of ceremony or individuals who come alongside them. Um, the death doula would be a perfect example of individuals, masters of ceremony, um, walking with people through the in-between spaces. So borrowed from that traditional experience, one way people deal with the in-between experiences is they have what we call masters of ceremony, people who've, who've walked through that process before, individuals who understand it a bit better, who are then able to use that um, 
um, in between that liminal experience to pass on values, teach on some wisdom, mentor and coach, prepare and equip so that when individuals are done with that space, they can transition well to the other side. Um, what happened traditionally can also happen in present time. For instance, if a company is going through repurposing or there's a whole reorganization and restructure, what some companies do is they bring in experts to help with the entire process. However, many times people confuse change with transition. Change is the external things that happen. Um, you're moving from state A to B, or you are changing jobs from company one to two. That's a change, that's physical, it's external. But transition is the emotional changes that happen within. So just putting that as a caveat that one of the, in, when organizing in modern time, organized liminal experiences, one of the difficulties is people confusing change with transition. But back to my example, so that I don't lose it is, if say the company is going through reorganization, one of the things they may do is bring in experienced people or experts or consultants to help the team or help the organization and design for and mentor through that particular experience. Or I see in modern days um, when children have reached adolescence in Kenya, that's usually class eight, there's these um, circumcision programs and then they're taken to say a school or a college and they go through some form of training. That's again, um, a similar um, experience or internships. Internships can become very good experience and um, in between experiences because you're no longer a student, but you're not yet fully a worker. So the internship experience can be a good um, in between experience. That's a traditional projected into the modern. The key thing there, before I go to point number two, the key thing there is that the properly understood and leveraged, the in between experience can be a time of exploring, it can be a time for creativity, it can be a time for reimagining, it can be a time where we shed off the old, we begin thinking in terms of the new fit is structured and proper. Now you and me know that that's ideal and individuals who get to go through everything I've described are the exception and they're privileged. It's not always the norm because at times the way transitions happen to us is like lightning from a blue sky. It leaves us uprooted and disoriented. And so at times we are thrown into the liminal space and the old is gone, the new has not yet come. You've lost your home, you've lost your job without warning, you've, you've lost a spouse without warning and you're in this new space. And so many people actually spend their in-between period very disillusioned. They try their hands on things, they experiment on things. And if there's no help and hope around them, many people, um, and this is me probably sliding into a future topic, many people turn to crutches. This is a time when many people either awaken old addictions or form new addictions. They begin either being addicted to certain processes or certain substances or certain individuals to help them cope. Um, with the reality of this. Others will engage in things that help with escapism, um, one form or the other. It could be procrastination, it could be blame game, it could be whatever thing. Others just retreat and they live in a never ending liminal space. They're in this in between space that is almost perpetual. And you, you almost get that these friends of yours who are always coming to you with a new idea. And even before it's implemented, they come to you with another new idea and another new idea. And it's maybe because they've not been able to handle a past liminal experience and therefore they seem to be perpetually stuck. So there are two ways basically of dealing with liminal space. One is trial and error, which very often leads to people being stuck or having support, what we call masters of ceremony, who then help you think through, walk through the new identity, who help, um, you break from the past, use whatever is relevant from it to help you construct a new identity that you will then match in into the future. Or you could try the trial and error method, which could work, but the path is more scenic and um, scenic meaning it's longer and circuitous and could end up with you not achieving success and significance. I think that would be a top level for it, Paul. Over to you. Okay. Um I'm just wondering, uh, Jane, um, if 
that's you know the, we had a conversation on death and preparing for death and normalizing death um if we normalize the death conversation will we be stuck in the liminal spaces uh, or will, would it would it have um would we be stuck in a liminal spaces if we make um, death conversations a normal converse, daily conversation? And, and if you could give um, your lived experience of how you overcame uh, being stuck in liminality, if you were ever stuck. Okay, well, it was so helpful to just listen to what you said because so much of it um, connected with me. I think when you're at that threshold and what you really want is behind you, but there is no way to get back to it. I think a common response can be like, I'm just gonna hold my breath and swim, swim, swim and get to the other side and you know, get back to normal. I'm gonna get back to, get back to what I had. And I think that kind of thinking is the most destructive because you're at this threshold and what you want, you can't see yet or what is to be, you cannot see yet. So for me, the most helpful thing is I had a widow say to me, this is a two year experience. Like the first year you are in shock and trauma and just absorbing physically the unwanted change. And the second year you are creating a new identity without this person. And just having in my head that this was a very long journey and that was okay was the most helpful thing anyone could have said to me. Um, I think when you're standing in the threshold and you are not willing, willing to nurture your grief and feel that pain and feel that utter being utterly lost and, and stopped in time, I think a tool like a crutch is to compartmentalize your grief, to just put it in this box inside you, tie it up tight, and then go back to work and go back to taking care of who you take care of and go back to whatever your life is but that compartmentalizing, I've talked to so many widows and they say, I can't cry anymore. It's like there's a lead apron across my neck that all the feelings in my body can't come up because I've been pushing them down for so long. So I think when we're in the threshold, like uh, if we can give permission for those feelings to come up and out, I think grief is a movement and it wants to come out. But our inclination, if we are afraid of pain, we are afraid of that tsunami of grief that is hanging over us, then we push it down and we get really good at that. Um, and then say someone dies or a dog dies, it creates this crack through this, through the, the, the pushing down and then all kinds of stuff comes up and people have crazy grief reactions about maybe a pet, but it's really because all that other un, un dealt with grief, it has an opportunity to flow out. I, um, one of the other most helpful things, and I don't really know if I'm answering your question, but um, I went to a therapist and she said, close your eyes and imagine yourself at a time in your life when you felt really, you know, happy and self-actualized and like really good about yourself. And then imagine going to that self. And I said, oh, I can't, like she's tiny and she's made of plastic. And she said, keep going to her. So I went and I went and I went. Finally, she became life-size and she said, open your arms to her and see what she does. So I opened my arms and this myself fell into my arms and she said, tell her everything you want to tell her. Like, I'm sorry, you're going through this. Like, I'm... And it was this um, opportunity for self-compassion and self-nurturing, I think nurturing your grief is the way you get through the threshold. Um, and I said, why was I tiny and plastic? And she said, because you had compartmentalized your grief so thoroughly that it was like teeny tiny and far away. Um, there, all done. Sorry. Um, one other thing, there's a Robert Frost poem and he says, we are not here to remain whole. We are here to be broken and start again, over and over and over again. And I think that lesson of impermanence and that we will be at the threshold many, many times. Being here on earth, you go through many thresholds and the better you get at realizing that we're not in control and that we're not entitled to be with the people we love for as long as we want, um, 
I think it's good training. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I answered your question at all, but <laughs> that's just what came up for me while he was talking because it was so helpful. It's a, it's um, it, it's very helpful, and I think we don't realize we are gonna be at the threshold very many times so long as we are on this earth. And Mukimba, um, how do you help? patients, clients, the world, know, understand that bit, that will be at the threshold very many times. And um, how has um, the switch from the African way of grieving, I know they make fun of our tribe, right? Because we over grieve and are dramatic. Um, how has that shift from the way we grieve and hate and grieving, because we are like, you and nowadays you're supposed to be buried almost Muslim style for most people. How has it um, affected the way people transition? Um, so the first thing I've noticed is a lot of us have unprocessed grief. It's not uncommon. Honestly, somebody may be coming for a completely different reason. Maybe they're having marital problems or something of the sort, but a lot of the times or even addiction, and most of the times you can always source it to the same thing. It's unprocessed grief of whatever kind. It might have been loss of a loved one. It might also have been, you know, just the grief of a, oh, like we say transition between being a child and being an adult and the things that came and all the stuff that was lost in the process. So at the end of the day, my first thing, I really love storytelling, yeah? And I think storytelling allows you to normalize the process of grief. It allows you not to feel so alone and it kind of normalizes the experience. And then, you know, your brain starts to not feel so alone and that it's okay that whatever you're going through, whether it's the, it's, it's, it's the un, maybe unpro, unprompted crying in the middle of somewhere or just anger outbursts, you know, and all that stuff that comes with unprocessed grief, I think support and understanding the, the, the sharing of stories. I, I don't know whether we used to share stories traditionally, but I do know there was a whole process the, the, we shared stories, yes, because I think that sharing stories and normalizing whatever sensations that are being felt in that moment, you know, and being guided through that process, it, it helps. Whether it's even just the basic transitions, just the ones from being, and I, I keep going back to being an, a child to an adult, because I feel like that, that's, that's a part a lot of us Traditionally, I think we had we had that on lock. There was the whole age groups and age sets and all that stuff, and we were prepared to be adults. But most of us, you know, we come from high school, then we get dumped into campus, and then now we're all of a sudden we're adults and we're expected to handle responsibilities. Then we're parents, and there's no preparation. The preparation comes from storytelling, passing along my experience since I have been through this, I'm passing along my experience to the person who is coming after me. I'm telling them, you know what? At some point you will feel confused. You will feel lost. Your identity will be in question, who you were before this and who you're gonna become. It's, it's gonna be confusing and it's going to take you some time. It might not take you the two days of leave. It might take you a bit longer. Like Jane said, it might take you two years, yeah? It, it, the process of telling those stories, it normalizes the whole experience. And I think for, 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 for grief and for loss and just the whole transition in, in whatever form, storytelling, I feel, is the most powerful weapon. So even when a client comes, we talk. We talk about my own personal losses. We talk about their losses. We talk about the person that they've lost. And, you know, we share stories because being in that environment where you can normalize that conversation, because sometimes like in families these days, maybe people are very scared of the emotions and sometimes emotions can feel very overwhelming. And when they're overwhelming, we fear that they will not come to an end. So most of us have adopted the idea of avoidance and there's so many things to distract us these days. You know, there is friends, there's party, there's, there's alcohol, there's addiction, there's all these other things, there's relationships, there's so many options, there's so many avenues. 
to avoid dealing with the reality of whatever it is that you're dealing with. And being able to sit around and just share a story. I think the power of storytelling, I'm going to get stuck on the storytelling. Yes, storytelling is the solution. Storytelling I've seen really makes a difference for my clients, just that they light up because talking about what it is that you're going through, talking about your lost loved one, talking about your lost childhood, your innocence, all that is part of grieving and being able to share your story and also hearing other people's stories and them saying, you know what, I've been through this. This was what I went through. It mean, it, it, it's not easy, but some at some point there is hope. So yeah, okay. storytelling. Thank you. Um, yeah. Sire, I want you to do two things. I've seen your hand up, I wonder why. Uh, but, but one, I want you to, to like recap what we've talked about because Marcy has finally gotten in. We will figure out what Zoom was doing to me today. Um, Marcy has joined us. So I want you to recap because you're, you're better at it than I am. Um, what we uh, talked about so far, then she can, um, then we can see what to ask her. And then the reason why your hand is up can be said. Okay, go ahead. So I'll start with what I just wanted to, I have a question and a comment. That's why my hand was up. The, the comment was, um, I even typed it, um, even the way we moan, like my tribe, when we moan, we don't just cry, we talk. You know, we, we say what- To the cops. We, we you talk, talk to the cops. Yeah. We, say yeah. what, we say what that person meant to us. We ask questions like, so what will I be without you? And this is something that goes on for like a week or two, you know, and um, even after burial, there are other things that are done. So yeah, we were heavily, like I do know my community and my community is emblematic of very many African communities that um, had, just a fun fact of four, by the way, I went to Malawi, they are Bantus like us, but their burial customs are very Islam, mostly like you die today, you're buried within 24 hours. You, you know, like, no sooner do we get news somebody is dead than we receive information about burial. It happens um, really quickly. So, Mercy, welcome. Um, we appreciate God having mercy on you to let you in. Pardon the pun. Um, so, we've been talking about um, the sort of transitions that leave people uprooted and disillusioned. And uh, the Jane said something powerful for, for, for me so far, which was at the points when her as a death doula, when she's working with other people and in her own experience about how to move forward, she listens to her body because at that time her mind has been um, disillusioned. It's been thrown all over the other place. It's been pulverized with a lot of things and, and all of that. So she knows the expectations her mind is putting on her and what other people are putting back. She listens to the body. The body is able to say like, hey, I have no energy to move on. I need rest or I need hope or I need self-care to be able to, to get going. So that's, that's one point. So the, remember the overarching thing we're asking is how to, how to go through the sort of transitions that leave us uprooted and disillusioned. So one point that came through was um, listen to the body. Just, uh, just listen to it, respect it, honor it, um, let it be able to guide. Number two is what you find, what you found, sorry, what you found Mukimba talking about, which is the power of storytelling, leveraging into our own stories, leveraging into the um, stories of the people who are grieving um, for whichever transition it is they are going through, and the power of storytelling to support individuals going through such kind of transitions is um, not yet sufficiently understood, but is, has proved for her case to be a treasure trove. We've also looked at the concept of liminality, which is the in-between space during transitions where the old is gone, but the new is yet to come. And that this liminality um, can serve as a space for intense creativity, exploration, um, and guidance, but also it can be a, a period of intense disillusionment and could make people slide into unhealthy behavior. And it appears a thing that makes a difference between one or the other is whether you have the support of masters of ceremony, that is 
individuals with a bit more experience who can be able to walk you through that, that liminal experience. Um, there's a point Jane made that I am forgetting, but I believe um, so far this is what has been covered. So over to you for, but before that, my question is, so far we have leaned in on experiences like death, you know, the extreme of transitions, but I'm just imagining for that guy who is listening on and then what they're dealing with is they broke up with their girlfriend or um, the, in, in modern Kenyan language, we say they underwent character development. Um, how, do they, how do they incorporate this, you know? Um, I'm thinking about that um, person who's gone through a significant wealth loss and or somebody who has gone through a significant faith um, journey, a transition either into faith or out of faith, and now they're not feeling too rooted. I'm just wondering if my fellow panelists can help us apply um, these principles to such everyday existential realities. Back to the host. Okay, thank you, Saya. Uh, Masi, uh, you've, I'm so sorry, I don't know. Today, you and Jackie Aminga, I'm very sorry, I don't know what Zoom had uh, Malalu's in, the, that's the best word I can use. Um, it had its own thing, it didn't want you in, but you, you've got an in. Um, I just want um, you to give us a bit of your story and how, because I know you're still grieving your dad and you have never stopped grieving your mom, right? And, um, and just uh, take us through that and how you're transitioning. And because you're, you're, you come from a different society from the rest, Mukimba, Sai and I, how that is different because you're the people who grieve in one week, I don't understand. But just tell us how that has been and just tell us your story. Give us a, a spiel. You need to unmute. You can hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Good evening in Kenya. And uh, good morning at your place. You guys, I think it's uh, 11 o'clock. Uh, depending, yeah. So Eastern time it's yeah. 11, yeah. Um, yeah. Central it's 10, yeah. Yeah, my apologies for the one hour loss. It's again, these technical issues, but I thank God that I'm in because I was supposed to be in, in God's plan. Hallelujah. Yes, so I really wanted to be here. And like you say, I'm still grieving my dad. Uh, but it feels better than the original day or the, the process that was there in the beginning. And for me, through this far, I think, or I have experienced the fact that loss, loss is different for everyone. It does not matter either loss of a parent or what I've just had my, my panelists say of a, of a loved one, of wealth, of anything. Loss is for everyone a different a different space that you have never experienced before. So however, whatever the loss is, it becomes different. It becomes a new field. It's like getting into school and you don't know what to experience. So uh, I believe that loss, loss will take its own place depending on the person. Depending on the person, and uh, depending on your connection with what you have lost. Like now what you asked me about my dad, I was very close to my dad. Uh, the fact that he has been ailing for some time, for some years, uh, and the connection that I had with him as a caretaker, as a caregiver was quite tight. The relationship was tight, we were that close and working with him and seeing him sick again for me was a different space because I have known my dad for so long, for over 40 years as a strong man, taking care of his children, being able to do his things as a dependent, he was not dependent on anyone, he was independent. So seeing a sick person again starting to get unwell is a first loss because this is not what you know, you know a strong person. So when they start falling ill, you feel the sense of that person as a parent that you are losing your sense of support because you'd run to him for whatever you wanted. Even for him just being there, 
is a loss of your space of that person being there for you that you can run to in your mind you know that is there i can go and ask him i can go and sit with him i have a friend i have company but when they start feeling sick and start their body starts wearing out then again your emotions are down because you don't know where to run to you don't know who to sit with because now again you be, they become dependent on you roles change and they become dependent on you when you are depending on them. So I think for me, that is where my loss began when he started getting sick. And uh, I had to take that space again of now he's depending on me and I can't depend on him in as much as he's there and you're happy he's there. But the things you used to do together, like consult, like tell him I have issues in my life because he's again alien, then your issues and that space that you had uh, falls back. So for me, that is where my loss started taking place. And I think again, it is the same place that I started finding acceptance and walking the journey of accepting that this person is no longer what you, you were before, that person that you'd run to. So you need to start changing as a person and accepting that now roles have changed. It is you, it is them depending on you. So you need to again, start adapting as a person to be strong for them, to be there for them and not the other way around. So when the illness deteriorated over the years, somehow in his many Ill, uh, ailing, uh, ailing, I started accepting and looking at things on another angle, that things might change at any time. When you have a patient in hospital today, tomorrow they're in ICU, and you're like, I started looking at things and imagining that I would lose this person bit by bit because of the worsening of his situation. Somehow, I don't know, in God's timing, I started accepting or looking at things that they can go either way. And I think for me, that was preparing me for the worst. That was personal for me. That was a journey that I walked alone as a sibling besides my other siblings. So walking that journey of starting to accept that things might get worse, you don't know when, but having it at the back of your mind, I think for me was a preparation positive for me to prepare me for the worst. But unfortunately, death does not prepare you when it is coming. You might prepare yourself, but it might come in 10 years. But I think that that journey of starting to prepare yourself for me has helped me after his death or uh, when he died that moment, because even when he died, I was there with him. But back again, even if I was prepared, I was not 100% prepared in the sense that it is tomorrow, it is now. So when it hits, it hits hard in your small preparation, you look like you are not prepared at all again. So it's a space that you cannot say that it prepares you. It is a space that once you get in, you don't know which way to turn. There are no roadmaps, there is no direction. Even if you have people holding your hand, it's so much a personal journey of how you're going to walk into it. And you're going to walk into it day by day, finding out how do you breathe into this space? How do you speak into this place, this space? How do you accommodate what you're feeling? It's a confusing space altogether. So I think it is so different for everyone. And I feel when you do it on a personal level, take your time every day to personally a purpose to want to heal. Purpose to want to heal for me is what is vital. Purpose, I mean that you accept by start accepting that it has happened after the pain, when it happens. Pain is what brings out your emotions. You, the pain you feel is what makes you cry, is what makes you angry, is what makes you sick, your pressure goes out, your sugars, and everything is everywhere. So once your emotions are there, 
the next step should be you accepting. So how long you take in your pain and emotion, again, transits on how you go into your acceptance and adjusting. Have you accepted if you take too long in your pain and emotions, then the same measure of acceptance and adjustment, because these things are tied to one another. The pain, the emotion, and the acceptance and the adjustment, they are all tied to one another. So how long you stick into one position, then it prolongs the next position. So for me, accepting is your key thing and purposing to want to heal, purposing to want to let go. Those for me are the main characters of how you get to the end of the journey. Uh, like I said there before, I had started seeing these things and I think it's just wisdom from God or God showing me these times that are going to come, but I didn't know when. So I remember one time that he was in ICU and I told my sister, I, am, I want to start letting go. And I prayed to God and I told God, I think God, I want to let go of my dad, whether it is this time or not, I want to take that journey. And bit by bit I did. So healing for me when he passed on, it was painful, but I reminded myself that I had seen this before and I wanted to start walking that journey to heal so that not to set myself free, but to find peace within myself and to let go of my dad in peace. It, is, it has not happened a hundred percent. I'm still in that journey. But the joy of my heart is knowing that I'm working towards it. I'm working towards it. I have purpose to work towards it because I've discovered the more that you don't work towards it, you remain stagnant in so many things, in your emotions, in your physical, in your everyday life, it pulls you back because the minute it is mentioned, if you don't let go, then it pulls you back. Like I've said, uh, the counselor saying that um, uh, I've had to say something about you cannot take leave for long. I took leave, but I asked myself, so for how long will I stay on leave to heal? I had a good, uh, where I work, they gave me a lot of time and they told me take off until when you are ready to come back. But you are never ready. Every day is your morning day. Every day is your healing day. So again, you have to purpose that I have to continue living my life as I mourn every day, as I heal every day. You have to find a way of balancing and accommodating all those feelings as a person and still find a, a way of not breaking down, of not losing yourself. Like uh, she has said again, talking helps. When you talk to people, when you talk about it, today if I talk about it, I will not cry like the day he died. It's uh, two months ago, but the pain I feel is not as much as the beginning time. So I think for me, the transition depends on your starting point and how you, ge you, you, you generate to the other stages. Thank you. Yes, it was worth waiting for you, I, uh, I see. Um, time, talking and tears. Um, does anyone want to follow after Marcy? I know it's, it's hard, but does anyone want to follow um, up after, after Marcy? I think we need to get t-shirts uh, printed with all the things we get from these Zooms, like um, yeah. we'll be stuck in the thread, we'll be, we'll be on many thresholds. Um, we need to 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 talk and tell our stories from from Mukimba, and uh, as Masi has said, you have to purpose to heal. Um, does any of the panelists want to follow up after Masi? I'm gonna start. Um, picking. Okay, Mukimba. Hi. Uh, the, I think the only thing I, I I may have wanted to tell Masi or anybody else who's going through a loss is. There is no 100%. I feel like we always feel like there's something we're going to reach into and the loss of a loved one or the loss of a relationship or the loss even of our childhood or our innocence will, we will find ourselves the quote unquote normal that if we will go back to like a painless sensation that we will not 
be feeling that that actual physical pain, not just the psychological pain, there's also the physical pain of it. And sometimes that will make you be a little bit too hard on yourself because you're like, I'm not getting there yet. I'm not getting to that 100%, but that 100% doesn't exist. Of course, with time and with nurturing and storytelling and you know doing what is prescribed to do for the loss, to handle the loss, it will help. But you will always be at a loss. I think that's the key word. You will always be at a loss because whether it's a relationship, you know, sometimes when I'm dealing, I, I do have a program for rediscovering yourself. That's to go to Saya about the rediscovering yourself after a toxic relationship, after character development, right? And the one part we go through, yeah, is, you know, getting, getting to that part where we're grieving. We're grieving not just the loss of this partner that we had, but when there's a lot of senses that we had. Maybe we were innocent. We really didn't think that people were, could be unfaithful. Like we honestly, maybe we thought relationships are meant to be just between two people. And now all of a sudden we're seeing life in a new light. We are now more suspicious. There are things that we have also adopted through these situations. So understanding that you may never go back to that previous, that back door, the way you're saying in the threshold, you can go back. You can go back to not being in pain. You can go back to those sensations not existing, but there's something else that is not as painful as this threshold. There is something else. After the door, there is something else. On this other side of the door, there is something else. Thank you. Um, and if anyone can take a stab at Jackie's um, question, especially if you have unresolved issues with the dead. Um, yeah. Jane, do you have something to follow up after Masi or uh, and Mukimba? Yeah, I was just going to say um, the acceptance piece is so important. I once heard suffering is a wedge and on one side is what you want and on the other side is what you have. And the further apart those two points are, the greater your suffering. But if you can just accept that you don't have what you used to have, that um, you're su it can alleviate your suffering. Also, um, that grief is the feeling and mourning is the activity. I can't remember who said that, but grief really is about activity. And maybe this feeds into the question. Um, you have to come up with ways to forgive or to release that person who did you wrong and now they are past. And maybe you write them a letter and you burn it or ritual is such an important piece in being able to move ahead. So. Um, you know, for my husband, we would write him letters um, every year on his birthday and we would make them into paper boats and we would sail them on the river. You have to have some way to communicate with this person who is gone, whether it's just talking to them, lighting a candle and talking to them and telling them everything that's in your heart about whatever the incident is and how it was for you and how angry you are and how, you know, don't hold it in, get it out somehow and keep doing that. There's, you can go on grief journeys where you, you, you go on some physical place in the world where you and this person went and maybe you stop and you light a candle and you talk to them or whatever. There's just find an activity to help you process it. And, and Saya, how are we normalizing um, therapy and all those things that are very westernized in our, in, in our minds? We had therapy, we just didn't call, go to a therapist. We just knew it was our neighbor, so and so. Um, but are we normalizing therapy? And if they, you have any follow-up after Marcy and um, Mukimba and Jane? I think first is to change the nomenclature because <clears throat> um, are, are we normalizing? Um, so the answer is, Yes and no. Yes, because, because of talks like this and partly also due to the pandemic and the upsurge in mental health issues, people have been encouraged to go for, for therapy, okay? But no, because the stereotypes that exist, especially without word therapy, um, still do persist. 
and disproportionately so for men like me. We, the, the mental models we have been raised with are not such as are easily amenable to the pursuit of therapy when it is called therapy. And um, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm sitting in this panel here representing um, difficult transitions outside of death because death itself is it's a, it's a real um, thing. So difficult transitions like, um, you know, currently I'm thinking guys who are clearing with college debt and no employment or individuals who have to try and get a spouse in this age and time when it's, it's, it's not as straightforward as it used to be. So, so such people are having very, they're feeling very uprooted. Um, individuals who are having threats to their faith or their worldview. So individuals like that are, 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 are struggling. However, back to my main point. So I think one of the things that will make people embrace therapy more is I think the nomenclature needs to be changed. If the term therapy comes with it, neediness, weakness, dependence, um, we may need to seek to change its name. Um, I think we who are in the helping professions need to make up our minds whether we are married more to the language or to the outcome. So that if we want certain outcomes, if we want people to get mental health, if we want people to get better support, but it needs to be packaged differently, I think we need to be more um, open to changing the, the language. The second thing, um, like I intimated at the very beginning is something we did very well in traditional Africa was the experience part of our learning journeys. So I think one of the reasons many people are seemingly not pursuing therapy enough, and it's not the only reason, is because in many times the way it is given, it is outside of experience. It is outside, it's not a learning experience, it's not something immersive. It can be cerebral, it can be a book thing that you're being given, it can be a lecture, it can be a talk. It's not what Jane does. It's not coming and sitting with you through the journey or in the journey. It's more of, I sit and I, I recommend. So I think, um, should, should people seek more therapy? Yes. But I think it is time that we, the therapists and those involved in these um, various forms of support, um, in, introduced a whole dose of creativity into the process so that it becomes not just a learning um, thing, but it becomes a learning experience where people can be immersed. And finally, because most of the people who need these kind of things are adults, it is to just remember that adults learn what they want, when they want, how they want. And so we just need to make sure that uh, we provide therapy in a way that inspires them to do the perspiring. I really love what Masi has been able to for me, what her sharing taught me is that when she was able to get enough inspiration, she's been able to do the perspiration by herself. And I think similarly, modern therapy methods need to begin focusing on creativity that allows us to inspire people and then equip them for them to be able to do the perspiring. Those would be some of my perspectives, not complete, uh, open to listen to what the others have to say. Okay, and and um, I'm just wondering um, the transitions. How do we help children? Um, how do we help those who are differently abled? And what are the most useless things we need to stop doing? And this goes to also, uh, the religious bit. You know, God gave and God took that kind of stuff um, doesn't help. Um, does anyone want to take a stab um, at this mercy? How have um, your children been able to, to transition um, when uh, Guka has gone? With Guka gone? Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Uh, let me start by uh, looking at uh, how these uh, losses change our character. And I want to begin back behind when dad got sick and while I'm looking back at issues, when dad got sick, it changed my character a lot because he had issues with memory because again, he was aging and you needed to be very patient with him. 
my character was changed a lot by being patient, by being forgiving, by being silent, by watching what I say, by watching what I do, by listening more to him than me speaking, by being very sensitive. If, uh, following by the fact that he also died, I'm trying to say that character, your character is changed as that one person when you're walking the journey of life with the losses. Every station or every stage has you changing as a, uh, as a person character-wise. Like the way uh, Saya was saying in a relationship, you fall in love, your character is changed because you positively look at this person and you fall in love. Once then again, something changes and you break up, then again, your character is changed. You either become a stronger person or a bitter person, a better person or a bitter person. Our characters are changed at every season we are in. And it's so unfortunate because it's the same you person that has to walk this journey of changing your character. But looking at, uh, at what you have just asked and looking at uh, taking care of dad and his death, I think the other thing that has made me a stronger person being a Christian is counting my blessings. Counting my blessings in the sense that when dad was there, he were, we were able to give him food. He had shelter, he had medication. We, we didn't struggle because I looked at, I work in a hospital setting and when I look at people bring, uh, older people coming in with no, par with no children, it saddens my heart. So I count it as a blessing that even when dad was ailing, there were blessings that attached to his illness. We were able to provide for his food, for his medication. We were there for him. All these things that someone else would look at and wish in as much as he's ailing, you people are there. He's able to buy medicine. He has shelter and food. So counting my blessings is one strong vital Christian thing that has made me move from one step to another and able to release dad that it is well. He took care of us. When my mom died, uh, I was in class eight. My dad has passed away. My, my second born, my younger girl is in class eight. Those are 30 plus years. So I'm counting my blessings that we were not left as orphans. So those positive thoughts for me have really worked in my healing and worked in knowing that God has blessed us and worked in knowing that it was not in vain and worked in knowing that I need to release that his work is done. He took care of five of us. He was alone. In as much as he struggled, we were able to get to where he is. So as a Christian, I think like uh, what Dr. Tari was saying, I think most of these encouragements that we give people who are mourning, these people are so deaf, not by choice, but because of what is going around. So in as much as we are speaking to them, they don't listen as we would want them to listen and absorb because they are mourning, they are in pain. Maybe they are the same people organizing the same, maybe the funeral, you are organizing uh, other things in the midst of your mourning, in the midst of your crying. For me, be, me being there for someone who is mourning is good enough. Sit there. Let them say what they want to say. Let them send you, buy me this, get me this. Sit there, cook for me. Just people being around you, for me, I think it worked. You really didn't need to do anything or ask me questions. Uh, and for my children, it's many other times that we forget them. But I think for me, I really, my children again were very involved in their grandfather's uh, illness. When I was not there, I would send them to sit with him. When I needed them to do something, I would send them to be to be to do it for me in his presence. So they were very attached. So when it happened, I was very sensitive in giving them information. I was very sensitive walking this journey with them. Sensitive in the sense that I wanted them to be with me every day. I took account of how they are feeling what they express, what they are feeling, what they want, how do they want to express it? I told them, take your time and cry. Don't force yourself to not cry in front of people. If you feel you want to do it, walk this journey. It is your journey until you feel 
that you are okay for the day. Not a 100% okay, but okay for the day. When you feel you can't cry, that's okay. Enjoy that season. When you feel you want to cry, be in that space and take your time in your crying. If you need someone, come to me. If you don't need me to be a shoulder, you need your auntie, your cousins. I allowed them to be free in their morning season. And even now after it, we sit and we talk about it. I allow them to speak to me and tell me and ask questions. So I think for me, sitting with them, talking with them, being kind to them is a process and I have seen it uh, help them. Even me, when I'm around them, if I feel I want to cry, I do it so that they understand their mourning is not foolishness. And they, so that they understand that I also feel it. He was my father and it hurts. And many other times they also spent time with me to console me. So I think that togetherness and mourning together with my children has really helped me as a person and is really helping me work with my children. Thank you. I'm, I'm just getting therapy from listening to you all. Um, uh, same, same question. Um, how do we help the children and how do we help the differently abled persons mourn? Sa, is that your feeble hand attempt? Yeah, okay, go ahead. <laughs> Last time I put my digital hand, I was <laughs> also this time I did the physical. I think the secrets remain the same. Number one, we need to, so I'll say the, the three points. We need to communicate what is ending. We need to celebrate what has ended and we need to create the new parts. So those three things. So we need to communicate, we need to celebrate and we need to create three C's. So, um, whichever transition, whether it's teen to adult, I mean, child to teenage, um, loss of a grandparent, a death, a financial change. Um, and this applies to children and to um, the differently abled. K case in point myself, I was born with proper vision, you know, very good, had actually very good eyesight. And then my vision got lost painlessly and progressively. Okay, and so by I think a class three, class four there, I became legally blind. I had to move from literally sitting at the very back of the class to sitting at the very front of the class and still unable to see the blackboard. And so part of my commentary is based on what helped me go through and accepting that and what I wish um, would have been different. And it's still those three C's. So one is um, communicating what is what is ending, what is being lost, who is losing what, okay? Um, in my visual case, it was the doctor finally just coming straight to my mother after we'd run. We, we literally did tests from six in the morning and this was eight in the evening, a full day at Kikuyu, um, Thagoto um, Eye Hospital. And the doctor coming very clear at that point and saying, you've come late, the vision on the left side is gone. The vision of the condition he has on the right side, we can't do much. So the doctor didn't leave us with any no. false hope, you know, or ifs and buts, if you can sacrifice to the gods or there's this new technology being worked. There's no false hope. He communicated very clearly what has ended, okay? Um, what we didn't do well after that as a family is being clear about a, I still was expected to be really normal. You know, and I wasn't, I still am, I'm not, I'm not normal. You know, I'm still, I'm still given the same workload as everyone else. I was um, expected to uh, be, I, I'm, I've been clumsy ever since. I, I still am clumsy up to this. And people would wonder like, why are you clumsy? And I think that's a bit where it wasn't communicated what's really been lost. The, the doctor did their good part, but I was not really communicated what really has been lost. In my case, I needed to be told right there and then you will never play contact sports of any kind, okay? You should never play. Um, so I, I can play rugby, I can play soccer, and I was an excellent defender. So of course I persisted in football for some time until it became very clear like this is very dangerous. I could be elbowed um, into blindness or I could be hit by the ball into blindness. But one thing that was not done well is at communicating what has really been lost. So I think number one for children, for people who are differently enabled is communicate clearly what has been lost. Your Buka has died. You will not be, when you go up country next time, there'll not be a chance to, to see him. Okay. 
okay? Mm. Um, your vision is lost, your leg has been amputated, it means it's gone. It, 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 we, we need to communicate clearly that it is lost. We don't know if technology will ever catch up to give you a new prosthetic or give you new retinal treatment, but it's gone. Number two is celebrate. So there is a lot within our past that um, when we reach periods of ending, we, because of the disruptive and disillusioning um, state of endings, one of the ways we treat the past is we want to forget it or run away from it or altogether just go back to it and hide in it without moving. But I think a healthy balance is celebrate. And I think that is the power of storytelling um, and the power of what Jane was talking about, about um, remembering your past and that plastic child and being able to go through that entire process is celebrating it. There are things about the ending season that were great. The things about the um, ending season that were phenomenal and nice and they need to be honored. Many times why we have a persistent sense of pain and grief, even in a case of a breakup, I know I'm moving away from the parameters per set, but even in the case of a breakup, there are things about your significant other person that were worth celebrating. There is a holiday you did. There are stuff you did that is worth celebrating. I think the honorable thing to do is to honor, to celebrate that. And simple ways can be something like just doing a, um, partly, partly that is what burials are. They are a chance for us to celebrate a season gone. And that's why when they're either rushed or a stormy or a everything, they deny an important thing. Um, and when, when we create a ceremony to celebrate, um, in a workplace, it could mean, I mean, for, for children, when you, when you are, say, moving a home, um, you can go to their favorite room and cut a cake there and say, like, you know, from now on, this room will not be, will not be there because we're moving to a, to a new home and get to talk about what was awesome, what were the memories will they cherish about this, what will they miss, you know? And then it helps close that chapter very, very well, okay? Um, for somebody like me who lost my sight, maybe I needed to go back to a time when look at a book I wrote with my proper vision, look at it, celebrate it and say like, you know what, going forward, my handwriting will never be the same again. It's going to be bad forever, but I celebrate a time in the past that was good and great. So um, communicate, um, celebrate, and then create. And I think this is where you now begin encouraging people like this to begin thinking about possibilities, to imagine a world where whatever they're going through is not a limitation, but they can begin, if they have the power to create what it is they can create, and then begin asking them and encouraging them to think through with where they are, what's the, of this big picture they've been able to think and conjure, what is the next closest, clearest and logical step they can make towards um, achieving that reality. And that urges them to close the past and begin moving to the future without the future having a sense of overwhelm. So I think if we do those three things, it helps doing well. One big hindrance is wrong theology. So wrong theology is theology like, um, we loved you, God loved you more. A proper biblical theology does not teach that the dead go to heaven. So, and in fact, for some people, I, I, I read of a case of suicide, a child was attempting suicide because they had heard that their mother had gone to heaven and so they wanted to die so that they could join their mother. A proper theology would have told this child, no, your mom is in the grave. Someday soon, Jesus will come back a second time and reunite us as a family. So proper theology affects proper practice. You know, saying things like um, your loved one has become a star may seem good at that moment, but a God who steals mothers from their children and makes them stars or keeps them in their company is not really a God I want to live the rest of my life. So a proper sounding theology is going to be important in driving proper, proper behavior so that it balances the need for humanity to be given hope while at the same time being given the tools for healing. And a wrong theology affects healing while presenting a false hope. Back to you, Studio. Hello, Studio person is here. Um, Jane, do you want to take us up? Sure. Um, I think for, for dealing with kids of all uh, abilities, I think the number one thing is to work on your own self 
So you are comfortable with death. You are comfortable with these transitions, that this is just how life is because they're looking at you, your reaction to try to figure out what's normal for them. Um, and I think just basic education about what grief is, that it's not all sadness and crying, that it can be numbness and it can be confusion and it can be laughter and it can be this huge range of responses and give them permission that all those responses are normal and they will change over time. I think, you know, grief hits all of us at different developmental stages. And because kids are going through developmental stages more quickly than we are, it's good to educate them that it will be more intense. You know, if there's a mother daughter dance or something at your school where parents or grandparents are participating and you don't have a grandparent to participate. So just be aware that there will be many opportunities um, over your child's life to intersect with how this grief, you know, they could, the person could have been gone 20 years, but when their daughter gets married, that's going to be a grief moment because it's a life event that that person is not at. And I have a niece who has developmental delays and her mother died when she was 12. And I think for her, it's really great to have a community grief activity where everybody is participating at their own level. And we did at Christmas, we do the Mexican tradition of ofrenda, where you make an altar and we go around and we did it for all the people who had died, which was four. And um, we went around the house and gathered objects that they would like a glass of wine or a Christmas cookie or what, whatever. And then we all shared, we lit three candles and the first candle was for what we are missing from them in the past, reminiscing about memories. And then the present, how we are either remembering them or honoring them in the present and the future, what things are we looking forward to that might be hard or whatever. And my niece who has developmentally disabilities, she shared that it was the hardest was when she would go to school when she was in seventh grade and people didn't know how to talk to her after her mother died. And so much grief just came pouring out of her. And I think she was able to do it because it was indirect. We weren't specifically asking her her opinion. She could just share by looking at everyone else in the room and feel that it was normal. So those are mine. Okay, uh, Mukimba, as you, as you... As you, as you ta uh, tackle the same question, uh, I want us to wind up because Kenyans need to eat. Kenyans in Kenya uh, need, need to eat, but if in, in, in any case, um, is there, if the panelists have questions for each other or to, you never have questions for me, you should not have questions for me. And if the participants have questions they want to ask out loud, even in mother tongue, we will take them. So Mikinda, go ahead. Uh, I think the one thing I would just want to state, because everything else has really been touched on, is when it comes especially to young kids or, you know, teenagers or people who are not necessarily yet adults, I think also even for adults, the people we need to check more on are people, especially when we're talking about bereavement, losing a loved one, are the people who seemingly seem okay, the overly resilient ones. I think that's the people who there should be a little bit more focus on because those are who you should be worried about because grief is necessary. When you've lost something, you can't just 100% go back to normal, right? So for the people who seem perfectly okay, who seem to be just moving on through life unaffected, even for children, even children should have a response to a loss, yeah? There should be curiosity, however young they are. There should be curiosity, there should be something, there should be a response and it should be addressed. But when it doesn't exist, that is where the worry is. It's probably the best time to get them actual support from maybe a professional at that point in time, because what happens with delayed grief, it's never, it never, it's never the same as grief that happens at the right time. Delayed grief is, it's worse. It's, it's always inappropriate. It's always when everything has gone on for way too long. And so yeah, basically check on the people who are overly resilient. Check on the people who seem just way too well adjusted. I worry for kids, especially, who are overly 
overly adultified and overly now the parent ends up relying on the child for support let's say maybe like a spouse has passed on and then the parent relies on the children and there's this overly adult child who's just you know carrying on with life taking even over the role of the parent who has already passed on and that they, they come to really regret it later because there will be delayed grief that is an assurity that there will be delayed grief Okay, so last words and questions for panelists, and we'll start with Marcy, because you're that's the you arrange on my skin. Marcy, Saya, Jane, then Mukimba. Marcy, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think for me, I would want to to maybe conclude by saying, however bad it is, for me, the bottom line is how much are you willing? to move on because in as much as you'll have so many counselors talk to you if you block the willingness from inside for you to fight for yourself to move on to fight for yourself to heal to fight for yourself to move out of this space then it uh, uh, it will take time for you to heal it will take time for you to get out of this space yeah, and when you've been in that space for long again but stop so many things in your life from happening. Maybe even affects your work and your health because you're holding on. I know of a friend who grieved for so many years of the mother for five years. Every other day she would heal today and tomorrow, then tomorrow again, she's all over and mourning because she couldn't let go. So if we don't have that willingness in our heart to, to want to heal and to move on, then again, it becomes a problem. But uh, bottom line, I think it, it all was down to uh, God helping us, the grace and the wisdom and the strength to just move on because it's not an easy space. It's a new space for everyone that for, as I continue healing, it is, I keep asking myself, what would I do without God? What would I, how would I hold on? How would I be able to accept? Because it's not easy to accept the loss of a loved one, of something, of a job, uh, and be able to move on. If you don't let go, then your mind will not be able to think, I've lost a job. True, so what next? If we keep and stay on that mourning period, then we can't move on. I will not, uh, if I don't I accept that I've lost a job, then I won't be able to sit and think, do I do business? Do I get another job? Am I able to sustain where I am? Can I move into another house, a smaller house? How do I start fitting into the new space? Like uh, Saya is saying about accepting and uh, communicating, accepting and uh, recreating. If we continue staying in the same space, then we will not be able to move to the other stages of life because we cannot, we, loss will forever be with us, but it is our responsibility again at our own levels to accept these uh, losses as they come and uh, be able to move to the next level of our life because today we have loss, Tomorrow we have a blessing. Today we have a loss. Tomorrow we have a gift. So even as we receive good tidings, it's the same way. Then again, we should just accept when things happen to us in as much as these two, a loss and a gift are not the same. But as we accept to accept a gift, then we should be able to accept a loss. Then again, we are able to move on with life. Thank you, Masi. Um, Saya, you're up. So, transitions are not permanent. They are exactly that, they are transitions. They don't need to be rushed. They need to, we need to lean in into them. We shouldn't confuse transition with change because it's perfectly possible for changes to happen but people not to have transitioned. And therefore it's important, whether it's at the point of grief or whether it is um, working with somebody going through life development stages or 
individuals going through work changes or relational changes, it is always important for we who are present in their circles to check in with them and not confuse that since a change has happened and all the items of a change have been checked in, that that person has already transitioned. The best and easiest place to cover for weaknesses in transition is in strength. So I couldn't agree more with Mukimba that look out for the individual who looks well adjusted. Look out for that individual who looks stoic and brave and well put together. Many of them are the ones who in turn externally, they may have the tools to deal with change, maybe from professional from temperament, but internally, many of them do not have the tools to process the transition. Secondly, therefore, let us create safe spaces. Um, if you can't do it for many, um, if you can't do it like at the education ministry level, do it for one person. Let's create safe spaces where individuals can be able to process um, and their emotions through whichever transition they are going through. Let's be, let's be keen to create, to intentionally create those spaces. And then number three is we who have gone through the liminal, the in-between spaces, I think one of the things we need to embrace is the African mindset. One piece of the African mindset believes that we do not own anything, but rather we hold in trust, that everything we've received, we hold in trust. And secondly, it says we do not pay back, but we pay forward. Therefore, if you've gone through a stage, just be kind enough and look out for individuals who are going through a similar stage, not so that you will act as the know it all guru on a chair in telling them what to do, but being there with them because as a master of ceremony, you are able to then help them navigate that space without losing voice, vision or values because there are things you have seen through it. I don't know about other people on the call, but in my experience, one of the ways God allows me to heal through things or manage through things is by bringing in my orbit individuals who are trying to navigate stuff. And as I help them workshop it, as I work with them and walk with them through it all, it also helps me. So the African mindset for we don't own, but we hold in trust, we don't pay back, but we pay forward, would be useful in helping us walk back into transition spaces and help others too. That's it from me. Ben, you're up. Saya always says everything that is worth saying. <laughs> so, um, I just want to read a poem. To live in this world, you must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal, to hold it against your own bones, knowing your own life depends on it and when the time comes to let it go, to let it go. So I would just say, remember that just humans are generally bad at grieving and we are generally bad at supporting people who are grieving. So when you find yourself in the threshold for whatever reason, try to say to yourself, and now I am here. And now I am here to learn these things, to help myself, but also like Saya says, to help others. And thanks so much for letting me be a part of it. Oh, thank you. Uh, please send it to me. Um, oh, Mukimba. Yeah, Mukimba, you're up, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think the most important thing I wanted to do was to validate the experiences of every single person who's going through some sort of loss. Because when we're going through bereavement, society does grieve with you, they do go through the process with you. But I wanted to validate the new mom who has no idea what she's getting herself into. Um, the teenager who was a teenager yesterday, but is now living on their own, or you know, somebody who went from having loads of cash and now all of a sudden they're living a completely different lifestyle from what they were used to. There's that validation of the fact that it's loss and loss is a loss of identity. It's a loss of companionship. It's a loss 
of you know safety and security or whatever it is that or even possession whatever you had held on tightly dearly and whether it was a mortal person or the fact that you know everything in this world is fleeting none of us are exempted from loss none of us are exempted from grief none of us are going to be fortunate enough to make it through life without saying that we've gone through some type of trouble so I guess just that feeling that you're not alone, you're never alone. There's other people who've gone through it and they made it. So hopefully they can share their story with you. Hopefully you can read some sort of inspiration because that also helps reading stories of people who've gone through your losses. Because maybe you don't know somebody who is actually going through what you're going through at that point in time. We have the internet, you can research exactly the words that you're looking for in that moment in time and you always find a supporting story to kind of help you through the whole process but unfortunately loss is not <laughs> it's not just you know limited to a few of us and some of us are exempted from it I think that's also something that people struggle with when they are going through grief is they really didn't think there would be that type of person I had a friend who recently lost her husband and she's very young. And the one thing she just kept saying, I, I, I never thought I would be a widow. I never thought I would be a widow. And the reality is nobody actually thinks like that when they're getting into a marriage. I think that's probably the scariest thing to lose your spouse when you're getting into a marriage. But I think that keeps us stuck. The fact that we feel exempted from that type of pain and suffering. And when other people are going through it, we feel like we can accommodate their loss, but we cannot accommodate that loss happens to us. So yeah, I think those would be my two cents. Yeah. I think, I, I think um, remembering that we are mortal will be at the threshold very many times and to share our stories and share our presence and love with people would be awesome. Um, next week, we are going to, the next two weeks, we are tackling addictions. So um, next week, we are tackling the process addiction, the gambling, and everything, because I am shocked to learn that our fathers who've retired back in the villages are hooked to gambling. It is very sad. And then the um, substance has, abuse has been here for a long time. And part of it is a crutch uh, for people who've not grieved properly. So join us next week. Um, I'd like to thank the panelists who've been awesome and um, learned a bit of Bantu stuff in, at the beginning. And Masi, who really fought to be on this space, Masi, my heart out to you. Thank you, Mukimba. Thank, thank you, Jean. Sad, Dwe. Okay, thank you, Saya. Thank you very much. And thank you to the participants who, are, um, uh, who joined us both here and on Facebook. I hope this is helpful. And you can always post um, your questions on the, on the Facebook page. I try to look and try to answer in different languages sometimes, yes. Thank you very much. And we can join us next week and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Thank you, thank you, and bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for fighting to be on. Thank you. I will tell yeah. you. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> and for your still recording. Oh, gosh. Okay. As usual. Okay. <laughs>